Welcome to A Chat With Heart. I'm your host, Christina Martin. I'm a singer-songwriter. I live on a dirt road with my best friend, Dale, in rural Nova Scotia, Canada. A Chat With Heart is just me having chill conversations with people I want to celebrate and topics that I'm curious about. If you have a question or a comment for this podcast, call my Heartbeat Hotline, 1902-669-4769. To send this podcast even more love, visit me online at patreon.com backslash Christina Martin. I'm so happy you're listening. Our personal stories have great power to heal, influence, and inspire. All we have to do is show up for the conversation. If we just talk about it, we could shut a light, we could break a dark day. If we just talk about it, we can cut away, we can make a better day. Hi, everybody. I love this chat today with my guest, Manuel Kras. I only met Manny, and, and let me say that I, I think I'm the only one who calls him Manny. We met during the pandemic via email at first, and in this episode, we, we share the story about how we were connected. Um, my friend, Janis uh, Reicher in Hamburg, is to thank for making this connection. Um, after I'd asked Giannis if uh, he knew anyone in Germany that would be good to orchestrate my songs for symphony performances. So you'll hear the full story later on in this episode. Gosh, we cover... Um, oh, did people stay, still say gosh? Uh, gosh, golly, we cover a lot of ground in this chat. You'll get to know about Manny's musical background and how he knew at age 11 that he wanted to be a professional musician. Um, we chat Lego, mental health, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, EMDR, uh, rapid eye movement therapy, and uh, creating a life in the arts that doesn't necessarily abide by the expectations of society. Manuel Kras is an award-winning jazz musician, pianist, actor, and creative mind. After completing his jazz piano studies at the University of Music, SAR, he quickly delved into the interdisciplinary realm. He has become a sought-after figure in the independent art scene of the Southwest in Germany, making guest appearances at state and city theaters as a composer, arranger, stage musician, and actor. Notable productions include Untergang, Was ihr wollt, Jekyll and Hyde, and Plus Ultra. I hope I'm saying those right. Manuel has released several acclaimed albums, including four under his own name. His works have been nominated for the Quarterly Prize of German Record Critics and reviewed in FAZ, Jazzthetic, and the New York Cadence Magazine. You can find links to buy and hear his music and upcoming events at manuelkras.de, M-A-N-U-E-L-K-R-A-S-S dot D-E. I hope you enjoy my chat with my friend Manuel Kras, a.k.a. in our household, Manny the Magnificent. Manuel! I'm hyped! Oh, is this your first, <laughs> is this your first Canadian podcast interview? This is my first podcast interview like worldwide podcast interview actually oh my god i'm super super pumped and honored yeah i feel very blessed that you've uh made time for a chat with heart it's really good to see you likewise and hear you and uh well listen i want you to tell my little heartbeat uh listeners d just like where you are in the world because yeah you're not you're i, I don't know if i've i don't think i've 
chatted with any non-Canadians or non-resident Canadians. Um, so uh, why don't you fill us in on where you are, what part of the world? Uh, what part of the world? I'm located in Germany, in the uh, southwestern part, near the French border. Like if I hop into my car, I'll be in France in like 10 minutes or so. That's... Or maybe even seven, seven minutes. It's, it's, it's really, really close. I don't speak a word of French, though. It's no. uh, kind of embarrassing, but it's it's what it is. What about do you speak other languages? Because a lot of your a lot of, you know, Europeans do have at least one other language in there. OK, I said that as yeah, soon as I asked that, I'm like, OK, you're speaking English right now. I think we should give you credit. right now. I am. Yeah. But it's like I, I can order a coffee and some bread and baguette and stuff uh, in French and also in Spanish. But but it's all pretty uh, basic. Yeah, that's OK. That's super sexy that you can literally just hop in your car and drive over to France. Like that's it. It is. It is. And there's in, in Germany, there's this um, like this cliche that all the people from my region all speak French like fluently. And interestingly, it's it's really not the case. No. But the 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 French people across the border, just across the border, they all speak some type of German, like a heavy dialect, but it's yeah. still German. So yeah, there's a little bit of work to do on our end, I, I guess. Yeah. And can, can you perhaps dispel this myth? I think it's a myth only based on my own uh, touring experience in, in Europe. Um, because when, you know, people here in North America, you're talking to them and they're, and they're here, they hear that you're about to go over and tour in Europe or in Germany. The first, one of the first things they say always is like, oh, everybody speaks English. It's like this assumption. But I mean, do you, do you find that? I don't find that. I'm, boom. I mean, in, in Germany, I have no idea, obviously, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but apart from like, I, I got through everything with English just fine. So, but maybe it's it's just musicians and and actors circles. So, there's I, a lot more people who who speak English because they they're used to it in the business. Yeah, perhaps too. I found the regions. So the further east you go, and, and places in Bavaria, um, mm. I find that I do run into people who do not speak, and it's any English. Usually, it's. It's, you know, uh, like a, a generation uh, older than my, my own, ours. Um, mm. I think I might even be in a different generation than you. I think you're far younger than me. But, um, but uh, yeah, so I think that's part of it, too. But there are some regions where I've just found I, if I don't speak German, then I'm fucked. Yeah. Yeah, that might be true. I mean, it's it's definitely not a safe thing to just assume that everybody is fluent in English here. Mm. Well, I mean, I'm not fluent. I'm just getting by. <laughs> but um, yeah, it might be it might be a regional thing. Like Bavaria is it tends to be a little bit less open to the world without getting into that cliche too much. Oh, no, let's uh, shit on Bavaria. It's one of my favorite places. <laughs> just, really? Like, really? Oh, I love. Bavaria. I, yeah, we lived there and we did it for a while during an artist residency. Yeah, in Dachau, but, right? Yeah, but a lot of uh, when we're not in Bavaria, a lot of people kind of refer to, to Bavaria as, uh, as its own country, which I suppose at one point it kind of was in a way. And in many political contexts, they try to be as well, not like independent, but they try to do their own thing. Yeah, a little bit. And yeah, that's like it's it's uh, a good thing and a bad thing about Germany that we have this uh, what is föderalismus, a German word. Uh, Say like that again. Say this Fed föderalismus. föderalismus. Oh, oh, föderalismus. It's like we have these we have these states yeah. um, that are independent politically in in many aspects. For example, education. Yeah. And and also uh, cultural funding and stuff. That is this is all stuff that the the whole of Germany doesn't really care about much. But it's all like from region to region, from state to state, it's different. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, it has its advantages and also it, its disadvantages. Right. Well, I guess we won't get even more into that because what the fuck would I have to ask about? <laughs> Federal, <laughs> federalismus. <laughs> Federal, federalismus. 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 Right. 
But I want to go back to uh, your youth, and because I'm very, I'm very curious. I think my listeners、um, are always curious, curious about how did this, how did this musical talent evolve? And so I, I wanted to ask you if you have these memories, like of your kind of, or maybe your parents told you first times putting your hands on the piano. What was that like? And then. Like, do you have early memories of、mm-hmm. composing and playing music? Like, tell me more about that. Like, our household was very musical in in general. Like, my my father studied clarinet,、mm-hmm. and my mother was a hobby flutist, and so music was all around me when I grew up. And well, both of these. Woodwind instruments that were in the family—they're very, very delicate and they break easily. So I wasn't allowed near them. Okay.、Obviously. And <laughs> we also had this pretty beat-up piano in in our basement. And when I was—I think I was three—that's、uh, the the story. I just went there and said, "Well, you don't let me touch the clarinets and the flutes." So I won't let you touch the piano anymore. This is my、nice. instrument now. <laughs> yeah, way to go! <laughs> and I and I did, and yeah, that was kind of like the start. I I just、um, I took some lessons when I was five, I guess, I think,、mm-hmm. and and took it from there. I tried to compose some pieces. I I remember composing one for my grandma when she when she turned sixty. Um. Ah,、oh, that's sweet. It it is. It was also half borrowed from a piece that I was already playing at the time. So oh, so you learned about plagiarism? Did anybody else、yeah. know though? Like, did your grandma? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My my father totally did. <laughs> it was super <laughs> funny because like the 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 A part was actually an original. I came up with that. I discovered thirds and how harmony works, and and then I at some point I just thought, well, now this thing that I know. Pretty much fit in there, and then I did. And I, when I played it to my father, I played it up to that point. I remember that, and then I said, "Yeah." And then this is this.、Uh, it just goes on like that. And he <laughs> read the sheet music and said, "Yeah, how does it go on? Just play it." Yeah, you know, it's like this piece that I already play. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, the, hey. I think, but isn't that a, a good example too? That as artists, we do take inspiration, borrow, steal sometimes from other. I mean, I, you know, other artists, other pieces. We have to. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that we have to. Like this, this idea that creative processes just come out of nowhere. It's, it's just、yeah. bullshit. I、yeah. think. Because we're all we're all the mixture of all of of our inspirations, and there are so many in the world, and they're so easily accessible now,、mm-hmm. when compared to like fifty、uh, years ago. And we have to take everything in, I think, and and from there we remix, we we adapt, and it it's not less original just because it's it's inspired by something specific.、Um, I mean, it's a. Of course, just copying—that's not a good idea. <laughs> of course, but everything. Once you adapt it to something, you're doing an original thing、mm-hmm. again, and that's what creative people have been doing for 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 eternities, right? Yeah. It's just that, especially in in jazz music, where what I studied, it's there is this idea that you have to come up with your own stuff that was never there before. And it's it's super exhausting、so、to try and、pressure. do that. <laughs> yeah, it, it also means that you can't apply the things that you learned because you know them already. You you know how to apply them, so they're not original. They're already there, and that makes you reinvent the the wheel every single time you try to come up with a song or or a piece of music. That's not viable in in the long term, I think. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. I I mean. I can think of so many of、uh, the songs, or the songs I'm working on, or songs I've written, that the initial spark was I was either reading a book or listening to music in the car, and that triggered something, an idea that 
uh, uh, clearly came from, you know, sometimes it's two songs, uh, two pieces of or rhythms or whatever that sparked the beginning of another song that then I maybe took into a different, you know, different space or direction. But so I think that's an interesting thing to, to bring up that, that it's rare, rare to almost never that something really does just come out of nothing. And no, yeah. So, yeah. And I mean, whatever you heard or read or consumed in, in whatever way it, it moved you in a way. Mm -hmm. And that's the best starting point for anything that's creative, that something moved you and you're moved inside. I think it's just, um, it's the natural way to go. Also, there are so there's so much great stuff out there. Like when I try to orchestrate and someone comes to me and oh, this is this is just like Ravel. And I'm like, wow, this is the biggest compliment because mm. that that guy was awesome at orchestrating. It's it's wonderful that someone hears my inspiration from analyzing Ravel in in my orchestrations. It's it's yeah, I wouldn't feel offended by that. I love it. I love it. Sometimes I get um, a Dolly Parton, which I don't think I sound like Dolly Parton, but I love Dolly Parton and um, mm. and uh, or or like a, a reference to even artists that I admire, but I'm not I never followed them. But there's a um, people that's just a human, I think, tendency, right, to to sort of go, oh, where did where have I heard this? Or, or maybe they hear the influence. Mm. It's, um, you know, they. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I love it when those things um, come up, come out. Um, unless you just, your entire career, you only hear that one comparison, then that can get a little frustrating. Right? Yeah, Maybe I should move yeah. on and expand my, <laughs> broaden my horizons. Um, yeah. I read it. I mean, people try to, to structure their input, right? They, they try to, to connect it with things that they already know. Yeah. So it makes, them, it makes it easier for them to process it. And I think that's totally fine. The thing about like comparisons or like copying people is the what I am always afraid of is copying myself. Mm. This is the one thing like that I've I always always think that this when I come when I write an idea and I've used that a similar thing before that I I'm just losing it. I'm losing my spark, I'm losing the creativity, I'm just copying myself. And mm -hmm. I mean, there are many composers and uh, artists who who made a career out of copying themselves. Absolutely, and especially in pop rock and folk. Absolutely, right? yeah, and film music. Hans yeah. Zimmer, it's it's all the same and mostly, um, and that's why he is successful. But still, I this is the one thing that I maybe have a vulnerable point. Um, I just try to not copy myself. I try to to adapt and try to. Yeah, just just come up with different ways of doing the same thing. But then in the end, it's not the same thing, of course. So I read a quote about you um, on your website uh, by the New by New York Cadence magazine. He never takes the obvious route. And I love that quote. I love it, too. So obvi <laughs> obviously, this resonates with you. And mm. um, yeah, expand on that, because I think what you were saying earlier does touch on that. Um, but is that part of your so is that part of your conscious? Like I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm looking out that I'm not copying myself, and like what, what would be the unexpected route? <laughs> like, do you actually yeah, have that, or do yeah, you just yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of naturally? Has that been your way in life? Like, I think it's both. I like it's it's the way that feels mm, just yeah, just right for me, but also I have to keep that in mind because the obvious thing it's. Yeah, it's it's always there, but the first thought sometimes the first thought is is a good one, but in many cases the first thought is just what springs to mind uh, first for me, but also to everyone else, and then it's just it kind of bores me, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's just I don't want to do um, I don't want to express myself artistically in a way that is predictable to everyone because it's the obvious route mm -hmm. and so i try to to just think again try to find the the core of what i want to do and then just evaluate from many from many different versions which one is the one that surprises me and moves me the most 
Does that, it. that make sense? Does it, is it, Absolutely. Is it cool? Yeah, totally. Okay. Totally. Artic- you know, Fumbling going back for to, words here. Going back to you saying how earlier, how you haven't mastered the English language or, or you don't feel like you're, I mean, you are, that you, you're good. You're good. You're great. <laughs> you're, I'm, I'm giving my best. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, no. It's all, uh, yeah, you're shining. It's fine. Trust me. As someone who struggles with the English language as well, I commend you. <laughs> I struggle you. with German as well. German is a crap language. It's, it's quite learn, interesting. It's quite interesting. Sometimes comical how long some of your words are. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's all I'll say. Um, but then that being said, I have actually yeah. enjoyed studying the German language, which I've conveniently forgotten most of all of it, but did spend years studying it and, and, mm. uh, in university. And, and, um, I found it, I think that the thing I did appreciate it was that, you know, there, there was like a, I found the structure of learning it to be absorbable. And I'm someone who grew up in a French speaking household, learned French in school, oh. struggled mm. with learning French. I found that more of a challenge for some reason. And then my German mm-hmm. in my started studying it when I was 19 um, for the you know first half of my 20s, I suppose. I got better at speaking German. I just found it easier for some reason. It, like there was a reason, mm-hmm. I don't know, it just made more sense logic like it was logical in, in a lot of ways, but then it, there were it's, it's very logical, yeah. yeah, that's true. It's also uh, it's downside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, anyway, germ, German Schmerman. Um, <laughs> hey, uh, I, I, I was curious because I read that you were up, like coming up. You have um, you're involved in uh, in a presentation called Anxiety, and I'd like to hear what that's about. I mean, obviously, it's, clearly, it's about anxiety, but like, I was curious about your own connection <clears throat> with anxiety, and anxiety is something that I've lived with um and uh you know done a lot of personal work to mm. uh learn how to you know learn techniques to basically uh feel fear work with fear do something that scares me you know l- like reducing negative thoughts increasing positive thoughts and ha- I, but learning the techniques really helped me they were a game changer in my life but mm. tell me about this project what your role in it is and then i'd love to hear about your own experience with anxiety if you have some yeah yeah yeah, sure um the the project is actually called like you it's a pun a german pun you could translate it like with angstitude maybe so okay so when i it's like (laughs) uh, anxiety and attitude as a oh so when i you know what here's the thing your website right translated automatically to english so i read it did it, I, when I, I didn't even know it does that. The English translation <laughs> was well. There, were, so it says you have a Whitney Houston in church thing coming up, and then there was it just, and then it said anxiety, 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 anxiety. That's, <laughs> so that's why. So t- okay, so tell it's a pun. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a pun because it's a it's an uh, an installation with with live dance. Ah. But I I actually won't be present. I'm just uh, I'm doing some I'm uh, reading some texts but mm-hmm. they're recorded. I'm also composing music for that at the moment. Um, and it's it's inside of a boat or like Whoa. a small ship. Yeah, it's cool. a, a small ship that's been rebuilt to serve as a theater room, mm-hmm. like a theater ship. It's it's pretty pretty nice. And we will um, just have a, a room for people to discover things inside of there. And yeah, it's, it's all about the it's all about fear and panic and anxiety and our attitude towards it. That's it. that's the idea. Like what, uh, even with um, with group dynamics, there's going to be a, like an old school telephone um, that w- someone picks up. It will pick up hopefully <laughs> somewhere in uh, during the. the no, pe- uh, people don't pick up the phone anymore. I don't know if you knew that. They'll pick up a cell phone, but they won't answer an actual. It's, it's a, like it's it's really really old. Like it's from from the seventies. It, oh, it doesn't even have button. It's it buttons. It has this this dial thing that you yes. have to turn. Yes, I and, love it. Yeah, and there will be some some text that only this one person will hear. Like there's there's two buttons in the room. Someone might press it. You will have to make sure they're gonna press it. 
if they press the that one button, things get very loud. Okay. If they press the other one, it's it doesn't. So now you you you, you think, <laughs> and so it's it's kind of psychological and and yeah, we're still in in the late stages of of getting the material together. Okay. But it's gonna it's gonna be very experimental and very interesting, I think. And it's um, I I started that idea with with a friend of mine, and when we talked about um, our own experiences with with experiencing fear, like mm -hmm. in a moment, what does it do with your body? What does it do you with with your perception of a room that you're in? And we we thought it would be an interesting thing to to do in an artistic way, in a creative way. And yeah, like I, I have a lot of experiences with with alarm situations in my body. It's not just fear. Mm -hmm. uh, I was diagnosed with PTSD a few years back. And so whenever there was a trigger, I just went straight into panic mode. And I know what that does to your perception of everything in that moment. So it's it's just all tunnel vision. Everything is on on alarm, mm -hmm. and it makes, or for me, it made the room twist Ooh. in a way. Like it it really it it made my my spatial vision change, and that was super weird. And that is something that we will try to um, to adapt with um, with a beamer and and a video artist who will just try to project the the ships in turn like the walls and stuff and then start to to twist and morph that onto Whoa. the actual walls so it feels like the ship is just melting or something yeah that will, and also it's of course it's rocking it's a ship on on water so it's it's uh not the most stable environment anyways so i i guess that will make some people experience in a hopefully a little bit more comfortable way, but still um, just make them think about what it, what does fear do to me mm -hmm. or anxiety or panic or whatever it is. That is super fascinating. So for you, in your case, when you got this diagnosis, like was that like a um, almost a bit of relief or like were you then able to find some helpful tips, tools, techniques that can I help you live with, move through that experience when you were experiencing the PTSD uh, symptoms? Mm, I mean, that I wasn't relieved. I know of many people who are relieved when they get the diagnosis. I was just like, okay, this, this kind of explains it. Mm -hmm. I, it all makes sense now. Mm -hmm. That's good, but it doesn't help. Like the diagnosis <laughs> itself, it, it it's still there. The, yeah. The, so, um, of course, it's the first step towards help. That's that's clear. But what ha what what has helped? Has anything helped? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, it's PTSD is a bitch. It it really is. Sorry for the language. Oh, um, are you kidding? You have you not heard? Yeah, yeah, you're you're about, all about swearing. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, no, it's it's really it's it's a really bad thing to have because you it's it affects everything. It affects your mm -hmm. energy. It affects your day to day life because behind every corner there are triggers. And for me, it was when I got triggered, and it could be by anything at at some point. I knew okay. I, I have to work through the immediate panic now and the next two days I'm just gonna be out of commission in a way. So I, it was just, it, it drained me that yeah. much. I had no energy. I just, uh, yeah, I just got through the days barely until I my energy recovered. Mm -hmm. And then if, if it went bad, the next trigger came and it all started again. So it really, uh, it affects everything in your life. And when I was at a point that I, I thought, okay, this is this is no way to get forward anyway. I, I can't live like this. This is not possible for me. Um, 
I just had the, I, I, just, I was lucky. I was super lucky. I got um, to a therapist who happened to, to specialize in trauma therapy. That was not a, not a conscious decision. I just uh, asked someone if they knew about someone and they're, yeah, I like this guy. This, this he's, he's cool. Mm -hmm. And I just, uh, it was the first try and it was, it was perfect, but that was really, it was not an achievement. It was just luck. Um, and he did a thing to me that's called like he of course first he stabilized and i learned i have a ton of um of things to do that can stabilize my emotions and my uh, bodily processes mm -hmm. when when i go into a panic or i'm just really stressed out it works for non pdsd stuff as well yeah um and when that worked and i tried to uh, i said okay i think we can we can stop fighting symptoms now and go to fight the root of it. Mm, yeah, uh, he, it's it's super hard, of course. Um, he did a thing that's that's called EMDR. It's, you know that? Yep, yep. Familiar with it? Yep. Correct me if I'm wrong, but does it not involve sort of like your eyes are closed and you're moving them from side to side, but you're at, they would walk you through the trauma and feeling yeah, all yeah. the things? Um, yeah, it's like it's it's a super it's it's a magical thing, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. Like it's some kind of bilateral stimulation to the brain. You can do that by moving your eyes left to right and right to left. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was like I had uh, buzzers, like small vibration motors in in my hands, and they just kept buzzing, right and then left and then right and then left. Mm -hmm. And that has the same effect um, because the brain gets stimulated in a way, and then you really like you you have to do the one thing that you have yeah just avoided doing all the time you just go into that flashback moment and you you yeah you you take the deep dive into it mm -hmm. and that's so hard mm. that maybe it was the bravest thing that i ever ever had to do it's it's wow. super hard and but and it was like, it was hard like there was a a puddle of tears afterwards on the floor I, yeah. I cried so hard wow but then i really have to say it, it's magic after that it was like i think it was two sessions and while you have these pulsing things in your hands and you you have all these memories all these pictures and all all the stress there it's like someone for me it was like it was on a screen that someone just rolls back it just got smaller and wow. at some point it was just it was so small i could barely just see anything yeah and then it was gone and then you take it you take it back and it's there again and then it's still again it's it's uh taken away the same way and in the end i can think about that that trauma now and i'm in control yeah that's that's the thing it's just it's gone and it's like i, I thought well, why would why wouldn't we do that sooner i right. mean this is incredible and he said yeah but you have to have the courage to do it and you yeah. have to work up to that but it's um really anyone who's suffering from ptsd i just i, I can't recommend that highly enough one of the things that i think growing up you do or if you go through something difficult in order to survive is you you try to forget it right you try to forget mm -hmm. it and or people in your life maybe perhaps at times are like focus on the positive don't you know and, and but when they say that oftentimes it's like let's just push it away push it down yeah and then it's that not does, healthy no it does not work <laughs> and uh um you know certainly at some point there's there's a bit of like i think i've got to accept that you know this thing happened this yeah. It happened and bad yeah. things will, will happen again. Like, cause that's another thing we're not really raised to. No one says, you know, that you're going to experience pain. It is a part of being human. Um, yeah, yeah. And also you're allowed to call bullshit by its name. Yeah. If things are, are just crappy experiences, you can say, yeah, that was a shitty experience. That's right. It shouldn't have happened to me, but it did. But it, it there's nothing positive about that and about the effect that it had and it's super liberating to just say that yeah. like that, that this is this was just a, a bad experience there's nothing good about it yeah and this is also something that we we don't learn in like in a society that we uh, live in yeah
we often hear, um, oh, there were different times or, you know, the excuses like as to why it might have happened. It's like, can we just fucking admit that this sucked and it shouldn't have happened? Yep. Like you said, yep. Yep. Um, the one of the worst things I find, one of the that sets me off is that when people just try, yeah, try to come up with all the reasons why it might have happened and. It's just so infuriating, yeah. so hidden, triggering. Hidden sense to it and, and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Believe me, I mean, I've done can... it enough myself, like to myself, you know? like We, to... we all have. We all have. I'm, I'm sure of that. And of course, there's, um, like, I mean, this my, my trauma is related to my children. And of course, it was an easy thing to say, well, that, that might have been bad, but now my children are here and they're great. Mm. So there's one good thing that came from that. It's true in a way mm. it doesn't make the experience better in any way so That's it's, right. it's just two different mm. things mm -hmm. you can ah uh, you yes i see what you said i was reading about this the other day um how you can acknowledge the crap and still simultaneously feel you know the good things like these emotions towards an experience can happen simultaneously it doesn't have to be just one or the other if that's what you were yeah yeah the good yeah. thing doesn't just justify the bad on that note because what i we do love talking about thank you so much for sharing too i, I do find it yeah sure um not only helpful to others i always found you know seeing people hearing from people's stories and experiences who live live a very fulfilling life success i think I, from my perspective you're successful i hope i don't know if you yourself uh, consider On that my about terms, yourself. Yes, yes yes you're good <laughs> the um, way i define success yeah. yes and and i think it's important for people going through hardships that uh, maybe don't feel that yet to say oh okay there, other people have success a successful life and still experience these things and they've worked through through it they've had tough times i can do the same but i do need to do some work I need to reach out for help those things those are the that's why these stories are so i think important to share and, and i thank you for opening up about that yeah i'm i'm all for that because i think it's it's super important to for everyone to know that mental health is an is an is a topic that almost everyone has to deal with at some point in their life and just because no one talks about it you feel like you're the only one and you're kind of broken mm -hmm. and that's just it doesn't help if you have mental health issues so just knowing that it's it's a common thing and like yeah. nobody get, gets worried when you have a physical illness if you break your leg but when you you break your mind in a in in some way that's just it's not talked about and that's mm. not not helpful so i think talking about this stuff openly is super important for anyone completely agree it's one of the things yeah. we we definitely uh, a lot of guests on this podcast um are so lovely in that they are you know okay with with sharing i mean why should they not be but uh uh i've just seen the power it has i've seen the opposite i've seen how it destroys lives mental illness and no. uh when when someone doesn't feel they can reach out when they are going through something so difficult on their own so um we, I think we do have uh, there definitely in the last you know five years especially, but even beyond that, I've at least here in Canada, like we do, we do really it, like changes. Positive changes have happened. People are. Um, we even have a. It's, you know, I don't know if you have this nine one one in Germany where a number yeah, you can call for. Well, now we have a four. I think it's four one one. I should probably check on that. It's a mental health crisis <laughs> line, which is incredible. Ah. Yeah, yeah, we have that too. We oh, even have it there like, we go. Not even on the on the phone. We also have it uh, available by chat, which oh, I also think is is great. It's yeah. a great thing because it it lowers the threshold. That's right. Uh, for you to to ask for help because it's more anonymous and and all that stuff. Absolutely, and I think it's um, like I have the. For me, it was easy to to say okay, like I'm mentally ill because PTSD is kind of like the um that one mental illness where you're where, where you're not at fault mm. if that makes sense like something happened to me and it was not in in my mind to do anything about it mm -hmm. it just happened to me and now now i'm kind of like i'm not now i'm a mess mm -hmm. so um but it's but it's it's just 
it's, it's not true. Of course, it mm -hmm. could. It, the same thing could have happened to me and not traumatized me. It could have yeah, been if could I be. was different. Could be. Yeah, totally. So, so it's just if, for depression, you always get told it's like your fault, and that's just bullshit. So, it's mental health is mental health, and it's everyone gets sick yeah. at some point in their life. It's just what it is. True that. True that. Yeah. No taboos. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Yeah. Um, listen, I'm, I'm, uh, transitioning a bit, actually quite a bit here. Yeah, sure. Fun, fun fact. All right. Fun fact. Fun you fact. ready? <laughs> you ready? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, fun fact about you is, um, you run a side business where you, uh, you sell <laughs> individual, seen I've seen it. I've, so I had the, <laughs> I had the pleasure of doing a rehearsal with you in your, in your studio and, but I had to walk through your Lego studio to get to your music studio. Yeah. And I, I want to hear about how that evolved into like a legit side business. If it's not like illegal, then you can talk about it. And <laughs> uh, it's totally legal. awesome. Cause Absolutely it's so, legal. it's just so, I didn't expect it. I didn't expect it. And I was like, this yeah, is nobody so cool. does. It's, it's, it's fine. Nobody does. Uh, maybe because there's always this, uh, expectation for creative people who do that professionally to just do that because when they do something else, they have failed or something. Yeah. It's like a, a myth, but for me, it was like, I, uh, when I w went to a very stressful time mm -hmm. in my life, um, my co-parent ordered a, a Lego set from from the internet, some, something, and she she came to me and said, "Well, you're so stressed. Take this Lego, go go somewhere quiet, and just build this for half an hour, and then come back." And then things kind of escalated <laughs> in a way. Um, really? Because I, I yeah, oh, because wait, I, with, I felt with like your, with your stress or with and do, do no, you no no mean... no 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 but with 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 Lego in my okay. life. So the Lego um, actually did building the Lego did in that in that example help actually. It helped super. It's a great thing Amazing. because just um, yeah, putting bricks on top of each other it it relaxes me yeah. so much, and and then I just thought okay, well that's. Lego is expensive and I'm still a musician and actor. So I, I don't have the funds to, to just buy Lego all the time. Um, and, but in, in many of these sets, there are collectible minifigures. There's a, um, collector's market for that. And I'm not a collector. I just like putting bricks on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, just, I just make a very, very small, easy, online shop where I just resell these minifigs, minifigures, um, to cross finance the whole thing. Yeah. And then, uh, COVID happened. Oh, and right. <laughs> yeah. 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 And in the first two weeks or so I got calls and gigs got canceled for 10,000 euros or something. It was really, really bad. I thought that's a lot. Okay, that's then, not a, that, that's not a trigger, is it? <laughs> That, no, no, no. That, but I thought, okay, that was the profession. There, yeah. there, there goes my plan for life. That sure, we it. all did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Luckily, I, I was wrong. Um, but then I thought, okay, well, what can I do? Uh, I, I can do the, the musical stuff that I do anyways. Um, but I have a lot of time now. So why not expand on, on this little online shop that is there already? Yeah. And then stuff grew and at some point that was all in, in my apartment at that time. Uh, wow. and at some point it was just, it was Lego everywhere in my apartment. There was nowhere to go. And then I said, okay, this, uh, this needs to go to a separate place. And this is the one that you saw. That is cool. Did your kids like that, that you took on, do your kids like Lego? Yeah, of course they have yeah. no choice. <laughs> 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 Well, that's really neat. I think that's cool. And uh, I like that you, t you touched on the myth that, you know, as if an artist um, needs to or wants to do something else to to raise money for their life. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. I too used to believe that I if I couldn't make a living at music, then I uh, then I was a failure, although I didn't I didn't really hold that standard up to other people, so I don't know. And, and you know, that's mm. that's definitely changed. But I think the, the that uh, the pandemic 
uh, confirm that for me that that is was b- bullshit and uh, yeah yeah I think there's a lot of uh, romanticizing of our profession in there oh yeah because it's like many many people do acting or music or whatever it is as a hobby mm-hmm. and and that's great I think it's super important for these people to exist and we who started usually in our childhoods as a, we, we started it as a, out as a hobby as well mm-hmm. and then we evolve it into a profession and then there's this you have to you make it you have to make it mm-hmm. so this is the one thing and this is all you do and yeah no I, plan I used b. to think that no. as well no plan b because even if you have, have a plan b or well, you've already failed right that's right yeah <laughs> it's, that's wrong it's that's super, wrong but yeah it's super toxic yeah i have no yeah but it's 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 super common but if yeah. you study if you're studying uh music then you're kind of allowed to do to be a bartender as well mm-hmm. but once you're you're done studying you have to just make your money off from there and but to be honest, like I, I don't even make that much money from from the brick uh, the Bricklink store. Um, but it it really helps with my mental well being. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's like when we do creative stuff, you, you know that better than anyone. You're never really finished with anything, right? You, you write a song, and there's always that one thing that you could change about it, or just try it out, or whatever. Maybe it's not finished yet. It's it's all very ethereal in that way. Mm-hmm. But when I get an order, uh, on in the Brickling store, I just I go there, I pick the order, I pick the pieces, I put them in an envelope, uh, I go to the post office, yeah. and that's that's it it's done and satisfying it, it's, i know job done yeah, it's i know super it's nice. satisfying yeah. or i get like 20 of 20 uh, of a lego set and i tried uh, i will put that into my inventory so i sort it out into their individual pieces yeah and at some point the desk is empty everything has been sorted into yeah. their bins or in, into their drawers and i'm done there's yeah. it's, it's just it, it's, I totally it's get this it. finite thing and it's so satisfying when all you do uh in, your, in the rest of your time is never really finished that's right and oh my god you just hit the hit the nail on the head like for me because i spend a lot of time kind of balancing these parts of my life the the sort of yeah the 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 artistic the expressionism the start you know starting songs and have it, you mm-hmm. know or or just creative projects but then on the other side like i love being a taskmaster i love i love seeing things come to an end like wrapping up projects mm-hmm. that yeah. feels really good to me even just completing and you know and i know you said sometimes in a song may may not be but to me like i do get to a point where i'm like that song is done like i'm moving on and that i love the i do love the process and the journey of it all but like i'm not gonna lie i really get a some kind of chemical release when i check a box yeah <laughs> and, of course dopamine you know, here we go i love organizing i love cleaning my house like i mean <laughs> not everybody maybe does but uh, i find it really rewarding so i could see that why mm. that would bring you you know some mental well joy really and yeah and it's just a counterweight to mm. to all the the other stuff that i do in my life yeah. which also is pretty scattered and and i i pretty organized as well but many many different things and i kind of like that i, I thought about that because you said um you like finishing projects yeah i thought about because you you with your music you have you're you are a project but it's never done right oh, because you might you. You yeah may, good point you might may put a, a put out an album and that is done but like evolving and doing the christina martin stuff mm-hmm. it's it's a project that will that will never be done truly yeah and this is a little bit different for me because all my oh, practically everything that i do in a creative way it's always been projects for many years 
I don't have that one band that I I've, I've been playing with for a decade or something, and that's my band, my project, that stuff, mm. or my my own music. I always do like this this theater play here, and at some point that it might come back, but at some point it's done. And I do this orchestration project there, and it's done when it's done because I send all the PDFs um, yeah. and and all that stuff. So I I really like my life to be organized in solitaire solitary projects in yeah. a way that makes sense because maybe because of what you say it's it it makes you um check boxes more i like the Even check in, boxes in the yeah, things. yeah I, I, me too. I will i will say that like thinking of myself as someone who i really do want to keep pursuing this um you know myself my 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 songwriting and my i guess i say i feel like an asshole when i say it my career um but I guess the most important thing to me is like, by the time, like when I'm on my deathbed, if I'm conscious and able to look back, I would like to look back and go, I've, I've evolved, I've grown, I've tried different things. I've, I did take risks. I grew, yeah. I, um, worked with other people who helped push me or, but, and supported, you know, we supported each other. We pushed each other, um, to be, but there is. I will say there is a little bit of a discomfort always in no in the that I will never be finished this fucking long ass project of me. Um but I do think that's an interesting, you know, even just metaphorically speaking like for our life as I'm working with a book right now it's called The Tools. It's it's uh I think a lot of people are kind of picking up on this book right now and one of the things mm -hmm. they talk about in terms of the the personal your personal self and is that the work is never done and and no. to accept the, the sooner you recognize that and accept that um the sooner you recognize that that you know challenges will be there in the future it's it's getting developing your skills and uh you know so that you could better cope really maybe mm -hmm. improve your quality of life um but that it's not going to end like that you are better off once you accept that yeah absolutely um, uh, so, but still, yeah. there are many, many ways through that. Yes. There's not. I mean, there are people who do like their, their ten year plans for their careers or their personal lives or whatever, and they feel comfortable just pursuing these plans mm -hmm. with all the tools that they have, and and that might make them happy. But like for me, that wouldn't work at all. In yeah. No way. I don't even know uh, what I'll do next week if I don't check my my schedule. Um, well, you found your, I, I mean, from talking to get having, I'm so glad we had some time to uh, together for me to get to know you like in person this past yeah. year recently. And um, I feel like you are a great example of like, it's not just one way to figure out your life and to live your life. I mean, you found your own way and you're going to continue to evolve. Like, I feel like you've kind of accepted that about and you are finding your own way. It seems to be working for you. You, yeah, yeah. Maybe because I tried to have the master plan when I was young, because mm -hmm. I, I did decide to become a professional musician very early on, like when I was eleven. Or that's so. for, holy shit! It's, it's it's really 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 early. <laughs> Good for you though. That's incredible. But that's... yeah, but the thing is, I I pursued that. I just I, I studied music and all that that stuff. And then in the end, I was like, okay, but, but things have evolved totally, uh, no, not totally differently, but still differently from what I thought, because I thought I was, okay, I'm going to become a professional musician. That means I'll play a lot of gigs and I'll teach a little on the side. Mm -hmm. And that is what I do in more specifically uh, playing jazz music. That would be the one thing that I do. And when I, when I look at my life now, that's not true at all. I, I rarely play jazz jazz music, like the original jazz jazz stuff. I still like to improvise a lot, sure, but like uh, the genre itself is not something that I, I do a lot of stuff in. And um, I never thought I'd go into interdisciplinary work with dancers or or just myself get becoming an actor as well. I, I never, I'd never predicted that. So now I, I do these 
super different uh, different type of things which are all in the general area of what i thought i would be mm -hmm. but it's still totally different from what i thought it would be so it's it's yeah it's paradox it. it sounds rich it sounds like you have enriched your um you know experiences in in work and and we i think i believe too that each project you take on then informs potentially what you could then take on again you know inspires and it sort of yeah. has this yeah. you know if you once you get to a point where you're like hey i'm gonna branch out and i'm feeling a little stagnant here the more uh, yeah the, the more unique opportunities you take on the more well-rounded you become the more enriched i feel like your life could become yeah there's this great interview with uh bill murray and i have i told you about that already no you, you haven't know? but i there's just a, i love bill murray there's an interview with, with bill murray and i don't know as some of the all uh, one of the old um old american talk show masters i don't know which one um and he he, he Johnny it's, carson it's, 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 and, was it Johnny Carson? No, 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 an older one. Uh, or is it? I have no idea. Um, That's okay. No worries. <laughs> yeah, um, but the thing is, he, it, it's a great interview. It's about an hour long. It's it's great, and he says something that really resonated with me when I uh, watched that the first time ten years ago. He he says that whenever he is doing anything, being on set, whatever it is, he tries to stay available for life, and I love that. Because it means inspiration is everywhere oh. and opportunities to to just learn something and and yeah, just discover new things are everywhere. Yeah. And and I love that because it's um it keeps you open, open minded. And that is kind of like what I try to do. And I think you do that too. Um uh, because oh. like you because you you approached me, we, we, we got to know each other when you were searching for someone to orchestrate uh, songs of yours. That's right. And that is, that it in itself is already thinking about the box. And when you think about the way that we met, it's totally uh, it was out so of the box. It, oh, it's super weird. Right. Let me share, <laughs> let me share that real quick. Cause you're right. And this is, I mean, to me, this is an example of like, I don't really believe in like just thinking about wanting to do something and it's going to happen. I really think, yeah. you know, action yeah. is power and, and, and when I started thinking about, okay, maybe I'd like to, my, one of my dreams is to someday play with symphony orchestras and have, have my music, you know, sing my music, perform that. And, um, and so I started doing a lot of outreach and asking people what could, how could I do this? You know, you've done this. Mm -hmm. Um, and the advice that was given to me was get some charts done, uh, get some charts done. Um, so I had to find some people that could do that. And so where I tour, uh, in part uh, quite a bit in, in Europe, mm. um, I thought, well, wouldn't it be great to find a European partner who could do this, but my God, I don't know anybody in the classical world that, you know, uh, and then, but I knew I do have some, uh, you know, pop rock, um, and trained musician contacts. So I asked a friend of mine, uh, Giannis, uh, who played drums with us in a, a couple of years ago in, in Europe. And Giannis, this is so weird. So Giannis was on a tour somewhere in Eastern Europe and he got out of his car. Do you know where he was? Do you remember that they were in the city? No, no, no. But it was some, uh, on like, some parking lot. Or yeah. Like it maybe was, in Hungary or random. something like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it was in a parking lot. He got out with his bandmates, saw a parking like a license plate on a car from Hamburg and it ended up being a conductor. Am I right? Yeah. Conductor that conducted a, a project that I had orchestrated. Exactly. What the fuck? Super so random. <laughs> Giannis, Giannis struck up this conversation with this conductor and said, do you maybe know somebody? I know this Canadian girl who's looking for somebody to arrange her songs for something. And, and that is how we met. And uh, I was, I just was so also also incredibly uh, amazed that you were so so 
not just easy to work with, but willing. And, you know, in, I felt genuinely you were in, interested in working uh, with the songs. It has been honestly a, a nothing but joy. I don't even do the work. I feel like you did all the work. I literally was just sort of like, you know. Can... <laughs> well, well, I... <laughs> I just build onto the good existing work. That's that's the good thing about arranging stuff. You well, just have to find the the good stuff that's already there, and then you build stuff around it. Well, the the communi the communication, and of course, I mean, I I I, I just had such a trust early on for your work, and of course, once we started hearing back the work, uh, myself and Dale um, were just so happy just so happy so it's really been it's really been a treat to know you and yeah likewise absolutely but thank you for saying uh that you know i I love that bill murray uh quote and uh i'm with you too like it's nice to have those moments where you're working with somebody um or you're you know you're you're finally in this in the rehearsal room you've worked so hard to get to this point where you're going to work and do this project live and you're finally there and you can kind of step back and go okay i mean i'm willing i'm willing to learn here and and do the fun stuff too and um and in part i think you know there's a lot of there's a lot of tough things about choosing to live the artist's life and make a living at it mm -hmm. and why yep. when i you know when i bitch and complain which i don't know if you do but i do i do still complain like why do i have to fucking do this and this is so much work yeah. but the reason i keep doing it it's for those times when i get to collaborate with no. somebody else or when we're on stage doing what we love and you just it just fuels you and allows you to go back and do the harder the harder things i think it's quite no. uh or you learn something new, you try something new, and all of a sudden you look at yourself and you're like, I can't believe I'm doing this, and I'm having so much fun, you know? Yeah, yeah. You never know what might be around the corner in a good way. <laughs> um, listen, I'm going to, I've started reading my goodbye message so I don't fuck it up, because um, this, this is my time to be as uh, sincere as possible in expressing how I feel about you. Okay, you ready? Uh, uh, I'm not sure, but go ahead. <laughs> like, don't worry, I'm not going to propose. Uh, okay, good, so goodbye. Uh, thank you, Manny, uh, for your time today and sharing more about yourself. Dale and I had the absolute pleasure of performing with you at our show in Dachau in Germany recently, and it was a real privilege rehearsing and then performing with you. I wish we lived closer. You are really talented, and for all your technical brilliance, you bring legitimate joy when performing. You can smell your love for what you do, and great instincts on songs. Like, super incredible, mm. like, improvising. I can't do that, and I'm just so in awe when I see somebody. It just, I was like, okay, wow, this guy's really something special. And you really do make it look like you were just born to be doing this this thing one when, when I what you know I haven't seen you in all of your uh, in all of areas of your life your creative life but in terms of you at the piano I'm like wow this guy he's at home mm -hmm. so that's Thank it that's so my much. that's my goodbye yeah 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 I have to, to to respond to it but for one thing because yeah I I've I feel very humbled by your words but you only got to see this this uh, good version of me because the circumstances were just right. Oh. And I'm not always that that joyful in any in any gig that I play. But in Dachau I was, and I treasure that very much. The memory of that evening it was just incredible because everything was right, and that is your doing as well. It's just it's not just coincidence. Thank so you. Thank Aww. you for having me there, and and thank you for for your words. Welcome to the Heartbeat Hotline. 
1-902-669-4769. I'm the host of A Chat With Heart podcast, Christina Martin, and I'm so excited you called. Leave me your question, a suggestion for the podcast, or a comment about this episode. Please be aware your message may be used on the podcast and social media. Tell me your name, where you're calling from, and it's also fine if you want to remain anonymous. Thanks for listening. Have a great fucking day. Thanks for listening to A Chat With Heart podcast, produced by me, Christina Martin. Co-produced and engineered by my husband, Dale Murray. Dale's a stellar singer-songwriter and music producer, so check out his website, dalemurray.ca. The podcast theme song, Talk About It, and I Don't Want to Say Goodbye to You, were written by me and recorded by Dale. Visit my band camp to find uh, CDs, vinyl, digital music, and fun merch like custom-made puzzles and temporary tattoo packs. Become a monthly or yearly supporter of this podcast and my music endeavors on Patreon. If you're new to Patreon, it's a membership platform that helps creators get paid. I love it. Sign up as a free or paid member at patreon.com backslash Christina Martin. I would love it if you had time to share, rate, leave a review, and subscribe to A Chat With Heart on all the places you listen to podcasts. Wishing you, my little heartbeat listeners, a great day.